All right, so there was a Scottish man uh, named Robert Dunsmere. That's where we're, we're starting with a Scottish guy, so there we go. Uh, but he moved to Vancouver Island um, to be a coal miner which this sounds like a setup of a bad joke, but, but it's not, I promise. Uh, but this was back in the late 1800s, and he was a simple coal miner, and he made $5 a day. That's, that's, and that's how much he made. Uh, but after the company that he was working for um, decided that there was no more coal left on that island, uh, Vancouver Island, uh, yeah, they, the, the company shut down, and they went back wherever they came from. Uh, his brother returned to Scotland, but, but this man, Robert, uh, decided that, that he was going to stay. See, because he had the feeling, he had the thought, he had some knowledge that maybe the coal uh, had not run out on the island yet. So he was going to continue uh, to look uh, for this coal. So day and night he goes in search uh, for this coal and, and he looks for months and he can't find anything and he's at the point of ruin, uh, but he decides to go take a day off uh, and go fishing. So, and, and apparently that's uh, good advice uh, because as he was fishing there in 1869 in this lake, he looks over and he sees this huge outcropping of coal uh, right on the coast. So he goes to the governing officials in British Columbia and he stakes the claim for that land and he puts everything that he has into this. Uh, he gets this acreage for pennies on the dollar, uh, but it takes everything he has to buy this piece of land. So he goes, and by the next year, they were producing 50,000 tons of coal per year. Uh, they were the, the sole coal provider for the entire uh, Royal Navy of Canada. Uh, they were the sole uh, coal provider for the entire West Coast of the United States of America. Uh, they were doing uh, pretty good. So then this man created a railroad uh, to move the coal, and as a result, he was a huge part of the industrialization of this part uh, of Canada. So this man went from $5 a day being a coal miner to when he died, he was worth more than half a billion dollars. Half a billion dollars, all because he saw an outcropping of coal and he knew what it was worth. And he threw everything he had at it. Um, this morning, we're carrying on with uh, our series in the parables of Jesus by looking at three parables. Three parables, really, really, really short parables, very, very, um, you know, very short parables, uh, but three very important parables. Uh, two of them are about discipleship and going after uh, um, the kingdom of God. And then the second one is kind of the culmination of those two. Uh, these are the parables of the treasure, uh, the pearl and the net. Um, and, and these parables are all found in the book of Matthew, uh, the 13th chapter, uh, and they are back to back to back um, there in that. Now, uh, most biblical scholars don't believe uh, that Jesus necessarily taught these or preached these parables in, in order, the, those, three, those right in a row. Um, you know, they kind of think that this was just Matthew kind of bringing in a culmination of a bunch of parables um, that he heard. Uh, you see, what we had to understand is Jesus uh, was traveling all around the region of Judea preaching and teaching so more likely he would have told these parables over and over and over again maybe even changed them a little bit and tweaked them uh, to his audience uh, so that they could hear uh, what they needed to hear but Matthew put these three parables um, in a very specific order uh, and, and we'll look at that why uh, but these parables follow right on the heels of the parable of the sower which we have already covered uh, the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven which we're going to look at next week and the parable of the weeds which we'll look at um, in two weeks uh, so these three these three short parables are tucked right in after these big long parables um, uh, but just because they're shorter does not mean that they are less significant or less important they're just concise and straight to the point so let's look at the first one here. This is uh, verse 44 of Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man has found and then covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he owns to buy that field. So there you go. Look at that. I guess they were short and concise. Literally one sentence right there. Uh, so a man is out working in this field and he is tilling up this field and he finds a great treasure. He finds a great treasure. Now, more than likely, you know, obviously this man didn't own the field. So more than likely, he was just a day uh, laborer. He was just a, a peasant out there doing farm work, uh, you know, just to get his denarius for the day so that he could, you know, have dinner that night. Uh, but as he is working, he, he uncovers this great treasure. He uncovers buried treasure and then he covers it back up um, and, and then goes and sells everything he has uh, to go and, and buy that field. So the kingdom of heaven is like finding treasure, buying that field so that the treasure 
um, is yours. Uh, you know, this concept of buried treasure uh, was, was really big back in the day. I mean, this was the equivalent uh, for us winning the lottery. You know, we talk about, you know, we, we want to win the lottery. That's kind of like where we're at. This is what, this was the first century equivalent of that. They're like, man, I hope I find buried treasure. And there was a lot of buried treasure to be had back then uh, because there were no banks back then. You know, there was no first uh, bank of Jerusalem that they could go and put all their spoils of war uh, into. You know, and there was always strife and there was always fighting among these people. So there was buried treasure, you know, kind of all over the place. So Jesus tells a story about a man who finds buried treasure. So this would have made the listener be like, man, I wish I was that guy. Man, I wish I was out till the field, you know, for one denarius a day and end up finding an, a, a buried treasure that I can just retire for the rest of my life on. So he tells this story about this man working in someone else's field, finds a treasure, but then goes. And after he finds that treasure, he goes and sells everything that he has so that he can afford to buy this field so that he can keep this treasure for himself. The kingdom of heaven is like finding a great treasure and giving everything up to make sure that that treasure is not lost. All right, on to the second one. These are the next two verses, 45 and 46. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and then bought it. So here we have a very similar tale. Uh, this merchant is in search of fine pearls, and he finally finds one. Uh, finally finds one in the market that has great value. And when he sees this this one pearl that he has to have that has great value, he goes and he sells everything that he has so that he can buy this one pearl. You see, this man, uh, this merchant, knew what he was looking for here. He knew the value of that pearl. Uh, there's a story about a man named Roy. Uh, uh, Weston, we'll say, um, he was an avid uh, rock collector. Uh, he went to a rock show, uh, which is not a rock and roll concert, come to find out, but it's kind of like a flea market where you can buy rocks. Uh, he goes to buy some rocks. Uh, he goes to this table and, and, and it says, all rocks, $15. So he picks up like a softball-sized rock and he, and he looks at it and he says to the guy, he says, so this rock's only $15. And the guy says, I tell you what, that rock is not as pretty as the other rocks. He said, I'll give it to you for 10 so hardly containing his, his excitement, he gives the man the $10 bill and he goes out um, and, and what he just bought was the largest known sapphire worth more than $10 million and he bought it for $10. That's a pretty good investment all because he knew what to look for. He knew the value of the rock that he had inside his hands. And this merchant in this parable was looking for something specific and he saw, he found what he was looking for and he knew the value of what he had found. So he goes and sells everything that he owns so he can buy this one pearl. Now, in the first century, pearls were top dogs. Pearls were like diamonds uh, nowadays. I mean, I mean they were, that's what all the elite people wore, the rich people wore. They were everything. So Jesus picks this, this right uh, uh, piece of jewelry, this right um, um, valuable thing to use uh, for this. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant that finds a pearl of great value, and he sells all that he owns so that he can purchase that pearl. Because he doesn't want to miss out on the fact that this pearl is in the market. He doesn't want to miss out on the fact um, that, that this could be gone. He can't miss out. He can't lose it. He saw something of value and he had to have it. He did all that he could to hold on to it for himself. So these two parables, um, you know, that we look at, I mean, these are very similar. I mean, this is a man working in the land and he finds a great treasure and sells everything he's owned. And then, and then a merchant uh, finding a pearl of great value um, and then sells everything that he owns so that he can buy that pearl. Now, they're pretty much the same story, except for one pretty uh, distinctive difference. Uh, the man in the first story, the man uh, out there working in the field, he wasn't looking for a treasure. He just so happened upon this treasure. He was plowing, going to do some planting, and found this treasure. Whereas the merchant, he was literally in the market looking for valuable pearls, and he finds this. Now, I know this is a small distinction, uh, and, and no, this is not the point of the story, but it still is a distinction that those who are looking for the kingdom of God and those who are searching for the kingdom of God can find it just as well as those who are looking at all. It's very, uh, very important. It is a very important distinction. Um, there will be those that are not looking for the kingdom and they find it, but the joy is the same. The joy upon finding is the same. The excitement upon finding is the same. And the call to action is exactly the same. 
And it is this call to action that is the main point of this parable. The call to action is the main point of these parables. The kingdom of God is like a treasure. The kingdom of God is like a pearl. And in order to obtain that treasure, we have to go out and give away everything that we have, sell everything that we own so that we can get this thing of value and make it ours. It's the call to action that is so important. Uh, there's a, a biblical philosopher named uh, Ka, uh, Klein Snodgrass. And yes, his name is Snodgrass. Um, and he has a book called Stories with Intent on the Parables of Jesus. This is what he says. He says, these parables presuppose that the kingdom is hidden and available to be found. Put it in another way, the kingdom is present and it is awaiting recognition of its value and the radical action that it deserves. It is not necessarily about reward in heaven or the age to come, although that always plays a part. But Jesus told these stories to announce the presence of the kingdom of God and to elicit the joy of discovery and the radical action of following him. So what we need to understand from these parables is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is there for the taking. It is there for the finding and the joy and the excitement of finding that is there, but there is a call to action from it. You see, the kingdom of heaven is of great value. The kingdom of God is of great value. Just like the treasure in the field and just like the pearl in the market, the kingdom of heaven has great, great value. And when we see the value of the kingdom of heaven, we can do nothing else but to give everything that we have away so that we can buy this, so that we can attain that. Why was it? Why was it that the man that found the treasure had to go and sell everything so that he could buy the field? Why was it that this man, when, he, when he's tilling up the land and he finds this great treasure, why did he have to go and sell everything? Because the only way that he could afford to get that treasure, to buy that field to get that treasure, was if he gave everything else away. Same thing when we look at the merchant. Why is it that he has to go and sell everything? He has to go and sell everything so that he can afford this because there's no way he could afford this pearl at the market unless he had sold everything. But, but the thing is, this man who found the treasure and the merchant who finds the pearl, they understand and they realize and they know the value of the treasure that is before them. They know the value of the treasure that is sitting in front of them. This man walking in the field looks at this treasure and says, that is worth more than everything that I own. So if I go and sell everything that I own and I buy this field, then I'll have more. And the merchant who's in the market, he says, he's looking at this pearl. He says, this pearl has value greater than anything that I own. So I'm going to sell everything that I own so I can buy this. The value of the kingdom of heaven is what is at stake. You see, these two men gave up everything so they could gain the treasure. And when we look at, at the kingdom of heaven, we judge the value of the kingdom of heaven. We have to come away realizing that the kingdom of heaven is greater than any cost that could be there when we follow Jesus. The value of the kingdom of heaven is greater than any value in this world. But see, here's the truth of the matter. All of life is about seeking after value. All of life is about seeking after value. Everything that we do is completely tied to the value that we have placed on things. Our motives and our priorities and the money and the time that we spend shows the values that we have assigned to certain things in our lives. If we put value in our career, if we put value in our family, if we put value in our children, if we put value on building up our bank account, or we put value on, on comfort and entertainment, we put value on sports, and when we put value into these things, they start getting ranked on what is more important, what has the higher value in there, and that is what we sacrifice for. That is what we sacrifice for. If we have assigned something a high value, and that is something that is important to us and has great value, it's going to be way up here on the priority list. But if we see something and we give it a lower value, we put it way down here on the priority list. If our career is something that we have assigned great value to, that we will work and work and we will spend hours upon hours uh, ignoring our family so that we can get up the corporate ladder so that we can have a great career. 
If we assign great value to our children's success in this life, we will do all that we can to make sure they are set, paying huge sums of money and investing huge blocks of time for whatever it is they are into, be it sports or music or academics. Now, these things are not necessarily wrong or evil, but when we assign something of value uh, higher than the kingdom of God or higher than the kingdom of heaven or higher than following Jesus, that's when we've come to a place where we have fallen into sin. That's the place where we have got our priorities all out of whack. You know, there are a lot of issues in the American church uh, in this day and age, and there always has been. And until Jesus comes back, there always will be. But the biggest problem that we have in the American church is the fact that we do not value the kingdom of heaven. We do not value the kingdom of God, at least not nearly enough. Not even close. We look at the kingdom of heaven as something that's, that's far off into the distance. We'll deal with it once we get there, but the truth of the matter and what Jesus teaches over and over and over again is that the kingdom of heaven and the life that we have now are one. This life that we are living now and this life that we will live through eternity, it's not two separate lives that once this one's over, we'll get to this one. No, it is the same life that flows together seamlessly. And what we do in this life determines what we're going to do through eternity. Yet for some reason, we don't put any value on the kingdom of heaven. We come to a place where we say, we're just going to worry about this life right now. And we're going to worry about uh, today and tomorrow and the next day and maybe get to the summer. But we don't worry about eternity. You see, we have to be focused on the kingdom of heaven. We have to be seeking the kingdom of heaven. We have to put such great value on the kingdom of heaven that we are willing to give up all of the trivial things of this life in order to get to this one. Just like these two parables, the man that found the treasure, he didn't keep what he already had and, and hope that the, that the treasure would still be there. The merchant didn't just keep all that he had and hope that the pearl would still be at the market. But that's exactly what we do in this life. We try to go through this life. We try to live like the world and we try to fill ourselves and fill ourselves and fill ourselves. And then we kind of neglect heaven, knowing that it will be there at the end of our lives, knowing that, that we can get it right right before we get there. But that's, ex but that's not what we're called to do. That's the opposite of it. You see, the things of this life, if they have a higher value than God or the kingdom, then we are in contrast or competition with God. You know, if we decide that we are tired and we're not going to get out of bed to go to church or get out of bed to pray or that we're too tired to read our Bible, then we value our comfort and our relaxation more than we value the kingdom of God. And in that, we will sacrifice and give more for our own comfort and our own rest and our own relaxation more than we will give for the kingdom of God. If we decide that we would rather build up our reputation in the community or build up our reputation in our friends' uh, circle, we would rather do that and bring glory to ourselves in this life more than we, the more that we value the kingdom of God and giving glory to God uh, than we have a problem. Instead, we'll be doing all we can to keep up with the Joneses instead of trying to keep up with God. Can't you see the issue here? Can't you see the issue with, with not having the right value assigned to the kingdom of God? You see, our relationship with God is the most important part of our lives, or at least it should be. All other pursuits in this life are trivial compared to the kingdom of God. Everything in this life is completely worthless compared to God. Every endeavor that we can ever do is completely worthless compared to the kingdom of heaven. Understand what God has done in Christ and following Christ are infinitely more valuable than anything else we could ever do. Anything that this life could ever offer us. The kingdom of God should be the most valuable thing in our lives. The thing that we will give up the most for. You see, the kingdom of God is present. The kingdom of heaven is present and it requires our response right now. It requires our response right now and it requires our response every single day. Because every day we have the choice, every single day we have the option of, of what value we're going to assess to that. 
If the kingdom is really as valuable as the Bible says it is, then it should bring joy and excitement in, uh, to our joining, and we should be involved in that kingdom. But the problem is most of us would like to have just a little bit of the kingdom. Just a little add-on, a little add-on of the kingdom to the rest of our lives. See, what most of us want to do is we want to keep a foot in, in both worlds. We want to keep our fists clenched around the things of this world, like our career and our success and our comfort, and we don't want to lose those things. We don't want the kingdom of heaven to interfere with our lives. We don't want the kingdom of God to interfere with what we're trying to build up over here on our own. We want to gain the treasure without giving anything up. We want to gain this pearl. We want to get this pearl, but we don't want to give everything up. Notice it doesn't say in these two parables that this man found the treasure and he went and bought the field. It says he gave up everything to buy the field. What if it said this man found this treasure uh, and he wanted to buy the field, but he couldn't because he didn't want to give up everything that he had? That would be a good story, wouldn't it? What if this story said that the merchant found this great pearl of great price, of great worth, of great value, but he couldn't purchase it because he was unwilling to give up what he wanted, to give up what he had already owned? That wouldn't work too good as a parable, would it? You see, we want to gain these treasures. We want to gain the treasure of the kingdom of God without giving anything up. But you see, these things that we hold value to will eventually come to a head and they will be pitted against each other. It'll be the kingdom of heaven versus my own comfort. It'll be the kingdom of heaven versus my family or the kingdom of heaven versus my career or the kingdom of heaven against my AAU baseball team. Where do we stand? Which one do we pick? Which one of these things has more value in our lives? And parents, listen up. The value that you assign to these things will be the value that your children assign to these things. If you are all in for the kingdom of God, chances are they will be too. If you are a full-time follower of Jesus and you do everything that you can, you sacrifice and you're all in, more than likely they will be too. If the kingdom of God is the most important thing in your life and the thing that you value the most, then more than likely that's what your kids will have as well. But if you as a parent assign your career or your comfort or your entertainment more value than the kingdom of God, then that is right where they're going to line up with as well. If you, if you treat church and the kingdom of God like something that is only there when there's nothing else to do, then that's how they're going to act as well. If you treat the kingdom of God like, like a leftover, then that's how your children are going to act. That is where their priorities will be. So where is your value? When you start listing the things in your life, what value do you assign to things? What are you willing to give everything up for? What are you willing to pay the price for? Because here's the deal. There are eternal consequences to this life and how we live it. There are eternal blessings for how we live in this life. And there are eternal curses uh, for what, how we live this life. And that leads us right into the third and final parable that Jesus gave in this passage. This is from verses 47 through 50 is where he says, he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace, into a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So right after Jesus tells these stories about this great and valuable kingdom of heaven, he says, well, there will be some that are thrown in the fire furnace. There will be some that gain this great treasure. There will be some that gain this great kingdom, but there will also be some that are thrown to the weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is why it's so important. This is why it's so important. This is why it is so important to see the treasure and to know the value that is there for that treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that brings in all of the fish. The good fish are kept and the bad fish are thrown away. Thrown away. The righteous will be kept 
and the, and the evil will be thrown to the fiery furnace to a place of weeping. Jesus is telling them that there's a reason why they need to gain this treasure of heaven, why they need to gain this pearl of great price, because there is an alternative, and an alternative to the treasure is not good. This parable of the net is, is another one that would have made perfect sense uh, to these listeners because most of them were fishermen. The fishing industry was huge in this region and more likely a portion of this crowd would have been fishermen. Four of his disciples were fishermen. So Jesus tells a story about fishing. And this net that he's talking about here, it's called a drag net. And the purpose of this drag net is that it was weighted on one end and they would throw it into the water and it would go all the way to the floor of, of the lake or wherever they were fishing and pull it in and everything within a radius of the boat would be caught and brought up. Literally everything would be caught. It was a net that caught everything and the fishermen would pull this into the boat and start sorting the good fish from the bad fish. The fish that they could sell at the market and the fish that they couldn't. So Jesus uses this analogy to show that all will be brought forth. That all will be brought before the king. All will be brought to be sorted. We see in the 20th chapter of Revelation that the righteous are sorted from the unrighteous and the righteous are given white clothing and spent eternity with Christ and the rest are thrown into the lake of fire with death and Hades. Jesus is just giving those listening an early view. You see, heaven is the goal of this life. The kingdom of heaven is the goal of this life. It is the joy and the excitement that we all want to attain. It's the place where we all want to be sorted to. It's the goal, eternity with Jesus. But there are requirements. There are requirements. No, you know, you know, no, we can't work our way to heaven. We can't be a good person to get ourselves into heaven, but there are steps to go through. We're called to place our faith in Jesus. We're called to publicly confess that faith. Uh, we are called to repent and be baptized. And we are called to follow. We are called to follow Jesus. And that following costs us. That following costs us to give up certain things. That following calls us to put the kingdom first. That following calls us to seek the kingdom of God above all else. That following calls us to give everything else up and to put God and Jesus and the kingdom first above all else. Listen, following Jesus is difficult. Following Jesus has a huge cost, but there is a huge reward. There's a huge reward. Imagine a laborer. Imagine this guy who's out just working for his supper. He finds this great treasure. He runs home and he gets to his house can you imagine him saying to his wife, we're selling everything we're on. we own. We're going to sell everything. Imagine what she would have said. There's no way. We're not going to sell everything. You're crazy. We're not going to give all of this up. And he says, trust me, what I'm going to bring back instead is better. The cost was great, but the reward was greater. Imagine the merchant, he goes home and he tells his wife, he's like, look, we're selling everything that we own so we can buy this one pearl. I've tried to make some Amazon purchase in the past and Brooke's like, absolutely not, you're crazy. I can see the same thing going on here. But he says, trust me. She says, that's too much. We can't sell everything we own. He says, trust me, what I'm going to bring back will be worth it. It was a great cost, but the value was so much better. You see, the kingdom of heaven is worth so much more than we could ever possibly give up. Look what Jesus wrote uh, in Luke 14, where he said, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whatever he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see will mock him and say, this man began to build but was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king of war would not sit down and first deliberate whether he is able uh, with 10,000 men to meet him who comes with 20,000? And if not, while, they, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. 
Jesus makes it pretty clear. Jesus makes it pretty clear the cost of following Jesus. Jesus makes it pretty clear the cost to get to the kingdom of heaven. Yes, it's not, you know, nothing that we can ever do. It's not great works. It's literally giving things up for Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is going to cost us. Following Jesus is going to cost us, but it will be worth it. Because how tragic, how tragic would it be for us that are so perfectly set up to gain the kingdom of heaven Miss it for something of this life. How tragic would it be for those of us who have grown up in the church, who've grown up in a country with religious freedoms, who have grown up with like 10 Bibles in their house. How tragic would it be for us to miss the kingdom of heaven because we were so focused on this life? How tragic would it be for us to lose out on heaven because we're so worried about this earth? How tragic would it be for us to lose out on the kingdom of heaven because we love the things of this world more than that? I mean, think about it. How tragic would it have been uh, for this laborer in the field to lose out on this treasure because he was unable or unwilling to go and sell everything he owned so he could buy the field? How tragic would it be for this merchant who has been searching for this one pearl his whole life, not be able to get it because he was unwilling to give up what he had. How tragic would it be for us who were perfectly positioned to get to the kingdom of heaven, miss it because we cannot give up the trivial things of this life. How tragic would it be for us to miss this because we place higher value on other things more than the, the kingdom of God. How tragic would it be for our kids to miss the kingdom of God because we didn't model for them all in discipleship. How tragic would it be for our kids to miss the kingdom of God because we showed them that the things of the world were more important than the kingdom of heaven. This isn't a game. This isn't a drill. This isn't just church talk. This is eternity. This is eternity and where we spend eternity depends on the short life that we live on this planet. Whether or not in this life we place our faith in Jesus and confess that faith and repent and are baptized and live a life following Jesus. What we do here fully depends on where we spend our eternity. Because we will be sorted on our faith. We will be sorted either righteous or unrighteous. So when we read and study and consider and ponder on these parables, we have to stop and evaluate ourselves and see where we are. Are we following Christ? Are we willing to give it all up for the kingdom of God? Are we willing to sacrifice for the kingdom? Are we seeking the kingdom of God over all other pursuits in this life? Because when the time comes for sorting, all will be sorted. In church, we need to be 100% sure that we are actively following Jesus. That we are actively following Jesus so we don't lose this treasure, so we don't lose this pearl. And we need to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to take as many people along with us as we can. Look what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Jesus, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Seek heaven. Follow Jesus and don't be afraid to give up the trivial things of this life in order to gain the great treasure that is heaven. It is the greatest joy. It is the greatest excitement. It is the greatest value that we will ever know, both here and throughout eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we are so thankful for that treasure. 
We're so thankful for these, these parables that we can read and look at and, and see your heart through. And God, please forgive us for the times where we couldn't give up the things of this world for you. Please forgive us for the times where we have said, now we want to build our own kingdom here. Forgive us for the times when we have thought that this life was more important than the kingdom of heaven. God, I pray that you will please break our hearts and let us know that we need to give everything up for you. And to do it in joy and excitement, knowing that the kingdom of heaven is greater. God, we love you and we live for you with everything that we have. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Father, we are so thankful that we got to come into your house this morning. Be with us now as we leave this place. Let us live every second of every day for your kingdom. Let us be a light to those outside these four walls. And we love you and we are yours. It's in your son's name we pray.